If you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 18. That's where we're going to be. Uh, before we get into our text this morning, I want to tell you about a humiliating experience. And you know what I'm talking about, right? We're talking about one of those experiences that just shake you to the core. You're like, I don't know if I can ever show my face again. It is so humiliating. When I was in my sophomore year of high school, we did this Easter play, and I had to be Jesus. Now, I was about this size in high school, so I don't really look like Jesus would have looked. I didn't have a beard. I had a short buzz cut, 220 pounds of solid steel, and it just was not ideal, right? Jesus was probably almost as dark as you could get as a Middle Eastern, uh, if not close to being um, an African. And so he was a, a Jew in Palestine. He probably had extremely dark skin. And so I, I really looked nothing like Jesus. You see pictures of Jesus today with blue eyes and blonde hair, and that's not how Jesus looked. And so that was embarrassing, number one. But number two, we had this small Christian uh, countryside church. There's probably about 80 people on a good day. And so they asked me to play Jesus the morning of. The morning of. So it kind of got thrown on me. Hey, he's bringing me water. That's what I'm talking about. He's one of our elders. He's pretty fantastic. Mark, you're bringing me water too? <laughs> this is great. That's great. Funny. See, I'm humiliated. I don't even know what to do. Uh, and so here I am playing Jesus. First of all, they had me take my shirt off, which was really awkward, right? And I got this really good compliment from my uncle after service. He says, Rick, it looks like you have breast implants. <laughs> it's humiliating. I'm like, thanks a lot. I don't know if that was a compliment or, or what. But then they put ketchup all over my body because I was crucified Jesus. If you've ever had ketchup on your body, I was literally gagging from the smell. It was embarrassing. I had to hang up on the cross in front of everybody in service. There was a really pretty girl in service, and so I wanted to make a really good impression, and it was just humiliating. After service, I, I couldn't even show my face. I didn't even want to go. They had to linger longer, you know, a lunch after service, and it was so embarrassing. And the reason why we get humiliated is really, is because what? We care about our reputation. We care about our pride, our image, how we look at other people. It's, it's why we wear really nice clothes on Sunday. It's why we have our Sunday best, is because we can't look bad in front of other people. My wife, Angel, she refuses to go to the grocery store unless she can get dressed up and look decent. I go out in my sandals with my socks. I really can't wait to, to enter that dad phase, you know what I mean? I can wear socks with strap-on sandals. It will be glorious. But it doesn't matter to me. I'm just kind of like, whatever. I'll go out pretty much in anything at this point. It's like my dad. But, but there are times where my own pride gets the best of me. I don't want to look bad in front of people. That's why I practice my sermons. That's why I try to look decent and presentable. And that's really probably true for all of us, right? Every single person in this room struggles with pride at one point in time. We all maybe could be labeled as arrogant. Think about what you believe. Jesus is the only way to God. You cannot get to heaven unless it's through Jesus the Christ. We have a very narrow-minded belief about Christianity. There is one way, one truth, one life. Even Jesus himself was accused of being arrogant. In John chapter 10, they said to Jesus, they said, how can you, a mere man, claim to be God? Claim to be God's son. And so even the world looks at Christians, and we do sometimes get labeled as arrogant. If it happened to Jesus, it will certainly happen to you and I. But I'm not talking about what we look like in the eyes of man this morning. Today and this morning, I want to talk about what we look like in the eyes of God. And it is a great paradox of Christianity that if you want to be a strong church, if you want to be a strong Christian, you have to be humble. You have to be weak. You have to be dependent upon God. You see, the Bible teaches us that God looks not at the heart, uh, or excuse me, God looks at the heart, not at the outward appearance. The Bible also says, I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind, even to give each man according to his ways. And so when we enter this passage in Luke chapter 18, starting in verse 9, we're going to look at two types of people this morning. You've got the man who is proud with the pride of Satan, and then you've got the, the man who was humble with the humility of Christ. It says, starting in verse 9, Jesus told this parable to some people, and look at this, who trusted in themselves 
that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. Two men, he said, went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. And I, I think about this Pharisee. He's, he's up front, kind of like I am, at the front of the temple. And there's people scattered throughout. And way in the back, on his knees, is this tax collector that nobody likes. And so he's walking up front, and he's praying this prayer out loud. And he's really kind of just talking to himself and boasting about himself. And he says, and I thank you I'm not like all these other people. And then he glimpses towards the back, and he says, especially like that guy in the back that tax collector that nobody likes. Verse 12, he says, I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. But that tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus says, I tell you, This man went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. You see, we have two types of people here, the proud versus the humble. They would have entered a temple, a large structure that had an outer court that you would enter in first, and then you could enter into the inner court, so to speak. And only men above the age of 20 were allowed to enter this place. And so the Pharisee probably sought out the front part of the crowd, the most prominent place, and the tax collector was in the back. And, but the, things were a little bit different on this day. You see, the court was kind of empty. Usually it would flood with all types of people, and they would be there praying uh, and serving God and paying their tithe. But it was kind of empty because the Pharisee was able to look towards the back and see that a tax collector was back there. And look at this first verse that we read. Who is Jesus talking about here? What is this parable about? Well, he says, those that trust in themselves, that they were righteous and viewed others, the Bible says, with contempt. You see, some people actually believe that God might exchange their merit, their good works for justification. That in other words, that because of the things that they do well, or that how they obey God, God will make them justified. He will declare them guilt-free. And the truth of the matter is, is that how many of us act like we believe this? We look maybe at other people with contempt. We focus on the good things that we do. And often in order to to determine how holy we are, we compare ourselves with other people. As Americans, we are living in a very dangerous time. Each person in this room that is an American has the ingredients necessary for the recipe of pride and arrogance. We have money. We have time, we have education, opportunity, we have social media recognition, we have an entitlement culture, and we have to be on guard against this idea of pride, this danger of arrogance, every single person in this room. You see, this Pharisee, he believed that I am to be separate from other people, that in order for me to look holy, I've got to point to the imperfections and the failures of other people. He said, God, I thank you that I am not like other people. I am not like a tax collector. And so we might call out poor business practices on Twitter or Facebook, but we don't dare call out our own imperfections. We say things like, boy, I'm sure glad my kid isn't like that person, or I'm sure glad I am not in their situation. Maybe we gain position in our family between brothers and sisters, uh, maybe even husbands and wives, friends at work, in school, or even in the church by pointing out the faults and character flaws of other people. You see, our perception of of ourselves should not necessitate the actions and the attitudes of other people. In other words, when we evaluate ourselves, we should not be saying, look at so-and-so and how they live their life. I'm not like that. Or look at the things that I do that they don't do. You see, the Pharisee made the credit about himself, and his prayer was literally to himself. And when I was reading this, I thought, well, maybe he was just talking to himself in his prayer to God. I mean, we all do that, right? But no, that's not the case. Here's what R.C. Foster writes. The Pharisee did not pray to God. He was writing, or he was talking to himself. He says there is a deep irony in that the phrase, thus with himself, 
God was purely incidental and secondary. He himself was all sufficient. The time and the place and the form were all merely chosen for self glorification. Look what he prays God, thank you that I am not like other people. As if he was congratulating. Congratulations, God, you have a worshiper just like me. I am great. I am strong. I am mighty. I am meritous. Look at all the good that I do, God. You should thank me for being like me. I remember watching Terrell Owens play football, and he was on the sidelines. And if you don't know anything about about Terrell Owens, he ended up, uh, I think, at the Bengals, but he played for the Dallas Cowboys, and I'm a Dallas Cowboys fan, greatest team in America. (laughs) And he said this, I love me some me. It's pretty arrogant, pretty prideful. To say the least, this Pharisee is completely full of himself. You see, he's not happy to give God the credit and the recognition. Here's what the Bible teaches. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 through 31, Paul writes this to the church at Corinth. He says, Consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh. Not many of you have got doctor's degrees. Maybe a few have a master's, some with a bachelor's. Most of you are lucky to graduate from high school. Not many noble. There's not many of you who have a six-figure income, who live in the elite class. Verse 27, but God has chosen the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of this world to shame the things which are strong. You see, in the kingdom, there's a paradox. God uses people like you and me, imperfect, weak, somewhat uneducated, lacking knowledge, lacking experience, not having the power and the might of the nation. God uses things like this. Verse 28, And the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen. The things that are not, so that he may nullify the things that are. So that no man may boast before God. But God, by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God. And we're getting to the important point here. Jesus Christ is our righteousness, our sanctification, our redemption. And so just as it is written... Let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. You see, in order for us to resist this idea of pride and excel in humility, humility agrees and is glad that God gets all the credit. And so you'll hear people in the church, they get tired of God getting the credit. This is my work. This is my ability. This is my strength. This is my talent. This is my money. These are my things. Glory be to me. God, you should be thankful that you've got somebody like me. But the attitude of a humble heart says, God, you get the credit. You are in control. And so this man, this Pharisee, wanted to give himself the credit. He wanted the recognition. Look at me and what I do. But secondly, he was blind to his own faults. You see, Paul also wrote in Corinthians, knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. And this man has puffed himself up before God that he is so wise and so holy and so clever. Isaiah wrote this to a nation who puffed themselves up. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. You see, this man that prayed before God never claimed to be unjust. He did not admit his failures. Yet in the same breath, he stood as jury and judge, not on this tax collector in the back, but every person. Thank you, God, that I am not like them. He freely charges the rest of men as guilty of a list of sins. He declares himself free from adultery, but he failed to take into account the attitude and intentions and actions of the heart. Jesus said this, if you lust after a woman to commit adultery with her, you have already done so. And so we find this extreme hypocrisy from this Pharisee, and he separates himself into this category, sinners who God does not love or like, and me. And how often we may do this very same thing. You see, Jesus hit the nail on the head. In Matthew chapter 23, he really drives this strong point home, not to sinners, not to people who are in need of a doctor, but to people who think that they know and they have the right way. People who are the most religious elite. In Matthew chapter 23, verse 5, he says everything that they do is for show. On their arms, they wear these extra wide prayer boxes with scripture verses. And they wear robes with extra long tassels. 
And they loved to sit at the head of the table at the banquets and in the seats of honor in synagogues. They loved to receive respectful greetings as they walk in the marketplaces. And they loved to be called teacher. And so you've got this man who is puffed up with the pride of Satan. But then we have another man sitting in the back of the room doesn't even want to lift his eyes to pray to God because he is so humble. He realizes he is a sinner. You see, first of all, in verse 13, he has reverence towards God. He didn't want to even lift his eyes to heaven, it says. And it goes on to say, he cries out to God, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And this is so very true. I don't really trust people who are unwilling to admit their weaknesses, who are unwilling to admit that they're a sinner, who are unwilling to admit that they are in need of a savior. Because that means there's a real pride issue going on. Everything is filtered through the eyes of their own perfection. The Bible says this in 1 John chapter 1 verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves. And the truth is not in us. You see, I am in a very unique situation. I get the honor and the privilege of being able to speak to you on Sunday morning. And if you've been around me any time, you know that one of the ways that I like to break the ice is to make fun of myself. It's true. It's fun, uh, but at the same time, it's humiliating, right? And the danger is, is that you can use this against me. You can. When I admit my failures, my faults, my weaknesses, my tragedies, my mistakes, you have the liberty to use this information against me. Maybe I lose respect in your eyes. Maybe I lose honor in your eyes. Maybe you will take the words that I say to you on Sunday morning and use that as an excuse to sin or to do your own thing. Well, the preacher does it. Well, Rick admitted it to this. And so I have great opportunity, but at the same time, I have great tragedy in that if I confess myself to be a sinner, I have great loss at stake. But at the same time, If I don't confess my sin, if I don't share my weaknesses, if I don't let you see who I truly am, I come across as this impersonal, unrealistic, self-righteous person who points to you as the sinners and to me as the righteous judge. And so I come across as extremely impersonal and unrealistic. I would rather err on the side of letting you know who I truly am than pretending to be someone that I'm not. And that's the reality for me. You see, I'm willing to take the loss of respect and value and honor in your eyes for the sake of delivering a message that's relevant, delivering a message that's true, letting you know who I truly am. There was a preacher I knew at the last church. The man never confessed any weaknesses. And when they were confessed, it was in the sense of a veiled confession, a false humility. I struggle with anger when I drive my car. Okay, right? Everybody does that at one point in time. Let me know who you are. Let me know inside your heart. I want to see the truth of who you are as a person. If you're a sinner, why? Why are you a sinner? You see, the truth about me is that I can be extremely arrogant at times. I can be hard-headed. Sometimes I will not admit that I'm wrong even if I am wrong. And this is true. I will argue for hours, maybe even days, but eventually I'll come around and say, hey, you know what? I was wrong. You were right. And sometimes it just takes a good pounding to my skull in order for it to get through to me. That is how I am. That's a weakness that I do try to work on. I can be overly critical, and I can really lack grace sometimes, even to the point of hypocrisy. You see, sometimes I'll look and I'll judge the inadequacies or the failures of other people, whether it's a program, a lifestyle, but then there'll be times where I myself suffer with that very same thing. And so I'm not just a critic, but I am a hypocritic. I'm a hypocrite at times, and that's the truth. Sometimes I want things my way because I believe my way is best, even though I read scriptures like we're going to read later on. Do not seek out for your own selfish gain. Do not look out for your own interest, but look out for the interest of others. And if you hear my wife saying an amen, you'll know that it's true. (laughs) Sometimes I can be defensive. Instead of solving problems I've made or caused, sometimes I'll Attack the person who complains in order to impeach what they're saying as misguided or false. I can be incredibly selfish. I can think about me, and often sometimes I find myself thinking about me. I battle daily against the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And I am certainly a sinner in need of a savior. And so this is true. And I could probably 
preach a whole sermon series about weaknesses and failures of Rick Bonifield. But what is the result of our humility and admission? What's the point? Well, look at what happened to this tax collector. In Luke chapter 18, verse 14, Jesus says this, I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. You see, the tax collector was humble. Humbleness or humility literally means to have the lowliness of mind. It's not necessarily thinking less of yourself, but it's thinking of yourself less. It's viewing yourself as you truly should. We are sinners. We need a Savior. We need each other. We cannot do this life alone. You see, humility is extremely necessary. It has to be involved in every heart of every Christian. And so what's the big deal? Why is humility so important? Well, first of all, our closeness with God is at stake. The Bible says in James chapter 4, verse 6, 